Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Mind, Body, Soul podcast. I'm delighted to have Paul Weston on today, um, a, ro- a former Royal Marines officer, um, a, a, trainee, a triathlete and a business owner who does amazing work all around the area of distraction freedom. Uh, I've, I've had the pleasure of being at one, one of his talks, and I'm in the middle of his uh, international best-selling book, Running in the Rain. So, um, Paul, well done on all those achievements, obviously, first and foremost, and a massive thank you for coming on to the podcast. Yeah, very pleased to be here, Declan. Thanks for inviting me. Great. So, like, I, I read in the book, obviously, what resonates is uh, there's quite a few similarities. I, I noticed that you're into a massive range of sports as well, and you'd, you'd mentioned the rugby and playing cricket. Uh, obviously, then the, the triathletes, you were just describing to me some events, you know, that are coming up and everything. Um, so I'd love to start with uh, maybe a little bit about your own journey before we go into some specifics as to how people can build the mental strength to really perform in, in all the different fields that you've performed in and what you've learned that can help others. Yeah, so um, I'm, I'm 59 years old, in, in my 60th year now. I don't feel 60, thankfully. <laughs> I've got ways to go till I really feel old, I think. But um, my, my whole life has been... Um, I guess surrounded by two key passions, music and sport. When I was when I was very young, I started playing the violin at the age of seven and I started playing rugby and usual things in school. And then as I was coming towards the end of secondary school in, in Yorkshire, where I grew up, um, I had to decide what I wanted to do in my life, basically. And uh, when I looked at all my school subjects and sat there with my dad and my mum, we listed them and the careers advisor said, put a check mark, a tick mark next to the, the ones that you like and a cross next to the ones that you don't like. And the only ones I put a check mark next to were music and sport. <laughs> and they said, oh, you're never going to get a job doing music and sport. And the careers advisor said, have you thought of joining a military band? And I love the outdoors. I loved the, I was in the scouts, I loved camping and being outdoors, playing rugby and going and traveling and making music and those sorts of things. So I was a clarinet player as well, played saxophone and viola and stuff. Mm-hmm. So I joined the Royal Marines. And uh, that, that was the next 26 years. So I got commissioned. I became a major as a second highest officer in my branch in the Royal Marines Band Service. Wow. And then, um, uh, you know, right throughout my career in the music, in, in, in the military, not only music was a key part, but also the sport, you know, the rugby and the cricket and the activities and just being active out there doing things. And then I transferred that to the business world in 2005. I emigrated. And my wife's Canadian and we moved to Canada and uh, set up a business here where I've basically been able to carry on being a musician and then practice a lot of stuff I'd learned as a military officer and my passion for just getting out and getting stuff done and being positive about things in the business environment. Amazing. And I had one of the things, Dan, that I wanted to talk about because the, the book is aptly named Running in the Rain and, you know, getting that ability to go out and train maybe when others wouldn't and doing it on a consistent basis so I suppose my first question for you bearing in mind all that experience from so many different fields is how can you use physical effort to build mental strength you know and and how do you see that link between mind and body yeah so the running in the rain is um, it for me it's a metaphor for life Uh, I hear so many people turn around and say oh you know I didn't go running today because it was raining now, it's a really poor excuse because, let's face it, you're going to have a shower and you're going to put your clothes in the laundry. What difference does it make if it's raining? Okay, it should be wet and, you know, those sorts of things. So let, let's, not, let's not worry about the weather. Let's not make an excuse and get out there. And actually, what's interesting is, and you'll probably agree with me, because I, I know, you're, you know your background and everything as well, that shower after you've been running in the rain is so, more, so much more rewarding than your regular shower after a regular run when it's dry. You just feel yeah. terrific. I got out there. I didn't quit on it. I didn't give up on it. And those sorts of things. Yeah. And you know, I have a theory that we, we spend every minute of our life in one of three what I call energy zones: a personal energy, a professional energy zone, doing work-related things, going to work, uh, meeting clients, selling our products, doing presentations, everything we do in professional capacity, and then a personal energy zone, things that are just for us on our own. So that could be yoga class, it could be sitting reading, it could be sitting watching Netflix, but you're on your own, you're not with anybody else, completely alone. Now, meditating, of course, would fit into that, or even just walking your dog in an evening. And finally, a social energy zone, um, where you're with family, with friends. And, you know, that can come into a, a work lunch with people. You're not talking about work-related things. Mm-hmm. And we have these sort of battery packs in each energy zone. And if you blend these zones together, what happens is you, you, your energy starts to become drained. So that if you're in your professional energy zone, but you're constantly distracted by personal texts and emails, you start to get behind on your work, you're draining your energy away because something's distracting, it's sucking that energy away. Likewise, if you're in your personal energy zone, 
you're sitting on on you know out in your garden in the evening just reading a book quietly and yet your, your phone keeps buzzing with with social media texts or work emails you're dragging away the energy from your your personal zone and, and also in your social zone you know if you're spending dinner with your family and you've got teenage kids there who are constantly on on social media that's just dragging the energy away so that energy is really really important and we need to define and separate those three energy zones so we spend focused time in each of them to get as much as we possibly can out of them to keep our energy batteries up or packs up so that's a really key part of it those energy zones is a key part of the book as you know and if we we need to separate them to make sure that you know we're not not because if you if you blend and blur them all together you're diluting your energy zone it just saps our energy and people get exhausted mm. it's it's fascinating and i think it's it, it, like it's very practical the way you split them between the three energy zones I think there'll be people listening and wondering, you know, that's well and good, but how do you go about, you know, setting the scene not to blur them, if you know what I mean? Because you'll see people who are, who use any opportunity, any little break in their day to go on and check their phone almost out of habit. So how do you go about like trying to build a bit of discipline into this? Yeah, so the first thing really is that if you're in your professional energy zone, um, you know, it, it's fine to check your phone, but only do it at certain times. Mm. So you start with 15 minutes and just turn your phone off, turn it on silent and have a simple task that you want to complete, you want to execute. And it could be just going through your emails and prioritizing your emails and just take 15 minutes to do that. But turn, you know, turn your Wi-Fi off. Go, uh, airplane mode is a wonderful button. It's my most favorite button on the whole on the whole laptop. And I love being on a plane. I do a lot of traveling, you know, through work. And I love being on an aircraft because nobody's going to distract me. I never, I never pay for Wi-Fi on an aircraft, ridiculously expensive. <laughs> but I love that because nobody's going to bug me. I can get on, I can get work done. And the great thing is that if you spend 15 minutes completely off the grid, if you like, going through things, there will have been a few emails that have popped up, but, you know, you haven't reacted to them. And whatever that issue was, it's probably resolved itself. By the time you check back in, you just read the last email and read the others. Oh, I didn't need to do anything. Mm. And if, if we're all guilty of reply all at times when we shouldn't be replying all, and that's very, very sort of demanding on people's time. So I think the first thing is, is, is to allocate, just say 15 minutes mm. to get offline, click on your, your airplane mode, go in and do a task, wherever that could be. It could be just reading through what you did yesterday to make sure it's good enough to send to somebody, something like that. Then extend it to 30 minutes and then 45 minutes, which is probably the most time you want to go. Mm. But it's very rewarding if you can block that period of time off and we do it in our personal lives you know if you go to a yoga class or you do meditation but let's focus on a yoga class nobody is going to be in a yoga class checking their phones they just don't let it happen yes yeah exactly that so we can do it in a yoga class you know life life carries on without us while we're doing yoga the world does not grind to a halt when we're doing a yoga class so why do we be immediately reactive as soon as we're in work? Yeah. And, you know, during my military days, there were occasions when I, back in the day, I'd carry a pager and we could be on, you know, immediate standby to move somewhere. Very rarely happened. But um, that's really important, have to be available. But I've never really come across a business who pe where people have to be at 15, 20, 30 minutes reactive to something. It just doesn't happen. You know, very few customers need an absolute instant reply to something. 30 minutes is perfectly acceptable. Yeah. So, you know, you can spend 30 minutes completely off the grid working on something. And it, that builds your energy because at the end of it, you think, I've got that done. Mm. I've got that task completed. I've now got lots of energy. My mind is clear to move on to the next thing. Um, because people say, oh, I'm a multitasker. And not, and, I mean, other than walking and chewing, or walking and listening to music you don't really multitask you just keep shifting tasks and you never really get anything done well so it, it's a discipline and you know in the book we talk about this with our focus zone um mm. through you know making living in the distraction freedom environment yeah and i think what you say there is very much looking at it at the individual level what, what, you know when you're in a, say a company and you feel under pressure from maybe a superior or somebody on your team then or or maybe this is yeah you know, something that, that you feel you need to be switched on all the time to email. Would you have advice for somebody who who feels in that situation? Yeah, absolutely. It's a great question. In fact, I was in Arkansas about two weeks ago walk, uh, doing a talk on how to live in a distraction-free environment to 5,000 municipal workers from around the world, mm. uh, they're from literally wow. all around the world, and it was a big conference, and I was hired to go and do a keynote to talk to them about this. 
And I know what the main question was going to be, uh, and I preempted it. And I said, you know, what are some of your concerns? I imagine one of your concerns to going into a focus zone is, oh, my boss needs me to be available to do various things at all times, and they pile things on me, those sorts of things. So is that a big question? Pretty much everybody put their hand up and said, yeah, that's our biggest reservation. Mm-hmm. I said, okay, so let's let's consider this. I said, uh, the first thing is, if you tell your boss what you're doing, uh, and why you're doing it and how the department, the team, the organization will benefit, there's a really good chance they'll say, good, carry on. <laughs> you know, you, you're not telling them, I'm just going to spend the next hour on Facebook or just catching up on a Netflix on my phone or something mm-hmm. like that. You're telling them, look, you know, we've got to get the strategic plan put back up to our senior leadership team by Friday at two. I want to spend an hour on Thursday afternoon completing this part of it so that we can present this on Friday morning. Mm-hmm. I'm going to be turning my email off and I'm going to be working in one of the quiet rooms out the back. Is that okay? I don't think there's a boss on the planet who wouldn't turn around and say, no, that's fine. You know, you go and get that done. I mean, yeah. And what's interesting is, is when I introduce this to my clients, the boss usually said, that's a great idea. Tell you what, why don't we all do that? At two o'clock this afternoon, we'll all just sit quietly and work on a particular project. Or yes. that's the whole distraction, freedom, focus zone that we work on there. And the other thing that's important about this is if your boss comes in and says, hey, I need you to do this for me, being able to turn around and say, OK, yep, that's fine. But these are what I believe are my priorities, these five areas now. Which one of these do you want me to take off? Mm. Because I can't complete all of these in time available to the standard you expect. And that's interesting because what, what often happens there is the boss will go, oh, I didn't realize you had so much going on at this time. Yeah. Um, okay, let me take those two or three away. And when I'm, when I'm coaching leaders, which I spend a lot of time doing, I, it's an interesting exercise. I say to them, you know, make sure you do a one-on-one with each member of your team at least once a week. Just sit yeah. down for 15, 20 minutes. And tell them to come with the five most important priorities for the week. Write them down. The five, what they think are the most important priorities for the week. And you write down what you feel should be their five most important priorities for the week. One, two, three, four, five. Mm. And then put them next to each other <laughs> and see what that looks like. And it, I've had leaders come back to me and say, that was a harrowing experience. <laughs> um, none of them aligned. This guy's doing stuff that he thinks is really important. I'm like, no, you should be doing this. Well, that's a complete breakdown in communication. Yeah. And one of the reasons that people get burnt out because they spend you know hours working on a project doing a great job and presenting it back and it's like no no that's not what you should have been doing you should have been doing this and that just burns people out so that's yeah. a really good exercise as well and once people understand what you're doing why you're doing and what the benefit is they'll give you time and space to do that which is critical i think what you allude to there is also having a le- level of assertiveness to be able to turn around and say that to, to somebody at work you know I'm, I'm happy to take that on but x y or z may need to be put pushed back a little bit and completely get what you the link to burnout there as well if, if you don't develop an ability to do that so i think that's that's really really um a great one i i want to just go back just um to the three energy zones uh paul because there was something i wanted to ask you just a little bit because it was a uh, it was something that came up in in the book was this idea of dilu- dilution yeah. um and i think you've kind of touched on it a little bit but how do you then avoid like the, something coming into one of your other energy zones, you know, like if you're, you know, say, you know, getting those work emails, you know, I heard once that it's very easy to go from uh, holiday to work mode, but very hard to do the opposite, right? It's hard to go back after looking at your emails to then being in holiday mode. Yeah. Uh, one of my clients in Toronto a few years ago, everybody had a work phone and he's a Blackberry back in the Blackberry days. And, um, their teams were going away on vacation, maybe March break, it's a sort of a school holidays here, and they're going off to Vermont and um, out, out west skiing with the, with the kids and everything, but they were keeping the Blackberries on, and these guys were coming halfway down the mountain, hearing, feeling the Blackberry buzz in the pocket, pulling over to the side and started texting on stuff and saying to the families, I'll see you an hour later for lunch. Well, the guys weren't getting a vacation, they weren't getting any holiday at all. Yeah, uh, never mind taking on a black slope when you're doing that. Exactly that, yeah. <laughs> just checking stuff in so what the ceo said to them was right when you're going away on vacation you're handing your phones in you're not taking them with you now if your desk your department your team whatever job you've got cannot function for the week that you're away you have failed Mm -hmm. i want to make sure that the, the the business can tick over while you're away and that's your responsibility to make sure that's in place and something that we call next we just call it next man up next person up Mm. And the essence to this is very interesting because what we introduce here is if you wake up in the morning and you're feeling really sick, you send one text or one email to one person and you know that your desk is covered for the day. 
you know that everything you're going to do, you've set that up so that you can just turn off the light, go back to sleep and recover during the day. You don't have to be constantly working because you need, you know, if you're sick, you need to get better. Yeah. And the same principle applies when we, when we get into um, an evening going away. Well, if you're more efficient during the day, you shouldn't have to take work home. But over the last two years with the work from home scenario, um, a lot of people reached out to me and said, how can I make sure my team are working when they're working remotely at home? And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I think like they should all be on a Zoom call so I can just check in to see if they're actually at the desk working. Mm -hmm. So, well, they may have young children at home. And it's just not practical for them to work all day. With, this can't be helped with the, the lockdown and everything. I said, don't focus on time, focus on the task. Make sure it's clear what they have to do and let them get on with it in a time frame that meets them. Mm -hmm. So those people may have young children at home. They spend some time during, during the day. But once the kids have gone to bed in the evening, seven or eight o'clock at night, then they'll catch up with maybe an hour's work. The trouble with that, what's happened that's come out from that is they were then sending emails at eight, nine o'clock at night. And that's become expected now because a lot of people are still working from home. Um, we need to stop that. And in fact, when I say to people, you know, do you like working from home? They say, yeah, I love it. And I say, why? Uh, because I don't have to commute. And the average commute for my clients, the average commute was about 10 hours a week. It's an hour each way, five days a week. And I say, what are you spending 10 hours a week doing more that you used to do you're walking the dog more you know you've got a really fit dog because he gets 10 hours more exercise a week or you're going to the gym more or are you you know being 10 more spiritual activities or yoga or whatever it is and they say no no i'm doing 10 hours more work because when i used to leave the house now i start work and we used to get home i stop work. no this is crazy i said you're getting paid for 10 hours more work no i'm not getting paid anymore okay so we need to make sure we refine that and we, we put parameters in place and shut that down. And the business I work with, they have a, a, a blackout at sort of six o'clock in the evening. No more emails going around at six o'clock in the evening. Now, if there's a, a, a critical issue going on, and I, I, you know, I have a client that I, I do some work with, and it's a global organization, and they may often warn me and say, we need, can you talk to one of our clients in Vietnam at, uh, you know, 10 o'clock this evening? And it's a critical case. Absolutely. Let's book that call in. You know, and I'll be on that call at 10 o'clock at night because it's 10 o'clock in the morning for them. Yeah. But very rarely does that happen. And, the, you know, and the out of office, you know, send an out of office saying, you know, I won't be responding to emails between six o'clock in the evening and eight o'clock tomorrow morning. Um, I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Like I said, there are very, very few business examples that cannot wait at least overnight or a few hours. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm just laughing there when you mentioned the different time zones. I was doing a bit of work with um, the Asian Pacific division of a company recently, and I was up at 2 a.m. And, you know, you talk about having to get discipline then around your sleep times and all that. It, it can really throw you off kilter, you know. Um, but uh, no, super, super interesting. So actually, I remember in the book, you did mention also working with a company um, on these blackout zones, actually, on a company-wide basis. So this isn't just something that applies to individuals. You can actually do this as a group. Yeah, it's a very interesting example, actually. It's, uh, it's, it's a company, a tech company, um, one of my clients in Toronto. This is about seven or eight years ago now. And their CEO was a big, big fan of Mark Zuckerberg, the Facebook guy. And he'd been to Silicon Valley and seen his office. And Facebook has, I think, 2,500 people working in one huge open plan office because mm -hmm. uh, he wants to create energy and creativity and all those sorts of things. So this guy, you know, got this company. It was a growing company, a tech company. And they, they bought a building and the top floor of the building was 350 staff. And they basically ripped the insides out of it. it had a completely open plan building with the original brickwork and everything and laid all this out. And he said to me, what do you think, Paul? I said, well, <laughs> I wouldn't want to work here. Why? He said, well, I like a bit of peace and quiet to get on with stuff. No, no, we're going to have all this energetic room and everything like this. So after three months, uh, we met up, we had lunch, and I said, how's it going? He said, well, I think you had a valid, valid point there because, um, you know, we're not getting a huge amount of work done, productivity is down, lots of energy, people like it. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the mistakes he'd made was um, he'd said to his staff, look, if you happen to be working after 7.30 in the evening, he got a meal voucher for the restaurant next door. Now, a lot of his staff were young people just out of college who, you know, got together and um, rented a lot of condominiums of apartment blocks in Toronto, which is pretty expensive, as you might imagine. Mm. So they weren't getting paid a huge amount as a sort of um, sort of starter sort of package from working for him. But once they got the, 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 the carrot being dangled in front of them of a free meal at night, <laughs> they're all making sure work dragged on to 7.30 at night. So oh, 7.30, okay, good, off for dinner now. And off they went. That's costing him a lot of money for a start. Mm. And he's not getting a huge amount of productivity done. And what he predicted was that, and I said to this to him, I said, look, you know, some of those guys eventually are going to get married and have families are going to be moving out of Toronto because you can't afford to buy a house downtown. 
uh, and they ain't going to be wanting to be working at 7.30 at night. They want to be out there at five. Mm. So yeah, it's a really good point. And some of these teams are actually going to sit in the parking in a car park um, with the laptops because they needed peace and quiet to focus on a particular task. So we tried a number of things. We gave everybody a baseball cap and said, if you want to be undisturbed, okay, work in peace, put your baseball cap on. Well, some of the ladies didn't really like that, quite, as you might imagine. That style is These luminous vests that you see on construction roadworks. Oh, that's even worse. Yeah. So, <laughs> so if, you, if you wanted to be left in peace and quiet, you put one of these on. But trouble is, some people are wearing them all the time. So don't talk to me, don't talk to me. That didn't work. <laughs> like, like a patrolman going around yeah. the office. Pretty much, yeah, walking around. So, you know, and, and of course, some people put their headphones in, but there's still, still too much going on. So we created these dark hours and we started with 30 minutes at 10 o'clock on the morning every day for two weeks. So at 10 o'clock, what we did is we, we put blinds on the windows, we gave everybody a, a desk light. So they turned the lights down so it was dark. And that created a, a feeling of sort of quiet uh, and understanding. It, it kind of, I got the idea from an operations uh, room on a, on a ship, on a, a, you know, um, a Royal Navy ship, a warship. The operations room is very dark and very quiet because it's a critical part of the ship, obviously. Uh, so we created this, this, this ambience and we made a few rules that no phones going off, no talking. OK, if you had to take a call, there was a couple of sort of soundproof meeting rooms, about half a dozen down the side, you could go in there. But no internal emails, just and, and have a specific task that you've saved for that half hour. So we did it for half an hour for, for two weeks. And at the end, we surveyed the whole company. There's 350 people in the company. 350 people said, we love it. Can we do it again in the afternoon and can we make wow. it a bit so we trialed this and we tried an hour, an hour is too long. 45 minutes was a really good time. And they do two in the morning, one in the afternoon now. So it's three every day and just two on Friday. But the great thing is that people save a specific task for these, what they call, we call them, we call them dark zones. Now we call them focus zones. Mm -hmm. And I've done it with dozens of different companies who I've worked with. And there's not a single company who's not said the staff love it. You know, and, and, and that's, that's, a, that's just a resounding success though. When you mentioned 350 people saying, getting back, like that's, it, that's just it's highly unusual to get that level of probably response and also that level of positive response this to something to, to, to quite a big shift yeah um, the, the the biggest challenge is a senior leadership team because they'd always been just oh i've got an idea and they'd wander out to one of their team hey do this mm -hmm. you know and the team members like oh, i just started doing that now you want me to do this so what, instead of doing that during the dark hours I just write it down and by the time the the dark hour was finished um, what we call the focus on now is finished, they'd probably change their mind again. So it's a good job they didn't go out and talk to the team. Yeah. They'd save up these ideas and refine them. And then they'd have team huddles. You know, I mean, I've worked in the, in the agile world where team huddles in morning and, and lunchtime are great because you thrash through stuff. And that, that 10 minute team huddle can save 100 emails because mm -hmm. you're getting through information in a direct environment. And even if you're working remotely, you can still do a team huddle every morning on Zoom, get people to stand up, review what you did the day before plan what you're going to do that day, say when your focus zones are going to be and ask your team who needs a piece of being one-on-one, -on -one, book that. And if you if, if I've got a one-on-one -on -one with one of my team at 9.30 in the morning for just for 15, 20 minutes, they're not going to email me. I've got an hour without email from them because we're talking at 9.30. Yeah. We can catch everything up then. And this is this strategic plan to do this is a great way of getting, of getting efficient work, high productivity done to a high quality and finishing work on time and feeling like you've done a good job. And you've really focused on it. And it comes back to running. You know, if you're checking your phone when you're going for a run, you stop it every 100 meters to answer an email. Are you really running? Are you really clearing your mind of stuff? No, absolutely not. You're constantly being, being bugged by stuff. That's brilliant. I'm a big fan of the team huddle as well. Like with direction, I, I was in a company a few years back that did religiously a, as a company actually got together, did a morning stretch and it was led by somebody different every day. And I love that because it also got maybe shire people out of their shell because everyone knew they had that responsibility and then everyone came to enjoy it and they yeah. shared things like the win of the day from yesterday which created a positive vibe but also then actually improvement opportunities and i think that can be a really good tool if used effectively you know and when i was when i was in the military i spent a couple of years as a staff officer in uh, head Roman's headquarters and uh, i ran a small team and um, every morning we'd have a little team huddle. And what I used to say to the team was a different person each day would, would take charge of the team huddle. They would facilitate the huddle. And they chose a location. So rather than just do it in a small meeting, one of our meeting rooms, uh, we'd either go out in the grass at the front of the building. Uh, and one day we went <laughs> into the ladies' toilets. So, so there's like six of us and five of us were guys and one lady took us to the ladies' toilets. So and we were like, wow, it's really nice in here. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what's interesting was... We remembered the content of that meeting 
because it was in a different place, it stood out to us. And that was really interesting. So just take people a little bit out of the comfort zone for that team huddle and get a different person to take charge of that huddle, just to facilitate it. You know, they're not, they're not shouting and screaming or anything like this. Just facilitate that meeting and keep people on track with stuff like that. And come up with something interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, one, one, uh, one of the guys came up with a, a squeezy ball. Uh, I had it with me now. I don't know where I put it. Anyway, a squeezy ball, basically. And he got a bit annoyed that people were interrupting other people when they were talking. So he could only talk when he had the ball in the hand. Nice. Couldn't talk at any other time. So, nice. you know, and he only had the ball for like a minute and then he had to pass it on. The next person would talk. And that got the message across very nicely that, you know, we shouldn't interrupt. You can only talk when you got the ball. Mm-hmm. Little things like that really make those meetings efficient. You know what? And just when you're talking about like little things that you have at hand and this is it's a bit different but i got one of these actually kind of inspired from one of your talks for, for my my focus zones now it's, it's it's a half an hour i find that works quite well for me but um you know i just put this going not all the time because i don't want to measure completely everything but what it is really helpful with is if i'm kind of procrastinating to get started on something is just to say right let's sit down get at least one of those you know your your your, your glass kind of done and start chipping away at this and then i find what comes then from that action is that motivation usually follows you know that sort of way and that, that's been something that's definitely resonated from what you mentioned about focus zones and creating that creating sort of the the zone for great work to occur yeah it's interesting i actually wrote a blog it's on my website called the benefits of a silent timer and the great thing is that uh, we, we have similar things and I've, I've got them here i can't see it. We, we send them out to our clients they're like they're very similar to what you've got there and they go, oh, it's kind of cool. It's like a bubble thing that floats up, but it's 15 um, minutes. It's just to start people into the focus zone. And what's interesting is that most people work for half an hour and don't realize that it's stopped. If they set the phones, they're in the flow and they're working well. Oh, the phone's right. I need to stop now. When in fact, unless you've got something critical to get to, you probably haven't. But if you, unless you've got a meeting, you've got to be at, that's fine. But if you say, I'm going to do 15 minutes, turn the timer over. I bet you've done 20, 25 minutes of good work. Oh, that's finished, you know. And you would have stopped working had it been a, a, a loud focus time or something like that. So that, that silent time is a really interesting, really interesting concept because when you're working, your flow is going well. Why would you want to stop? Keep yeah. going and get a job done. Amazing. What I might do is if you have a link to that article, I can put it in the show notes. Yeah. yeah we'll so that. just on that topic there, Paul, like I, I remember you mentioned this idea of the subthalamic nucleus. Now that sounds probably very geeky to people listening in. But believe me, this can be a game changer. So I'd love if you if you chat to us a bit about that and and give some of the great analogies that you you know that you gave to me in terms of explaining that. Yeah, so I, I wanted to look into why people can't focus on a job for long and uh, lots of different sort of stuff from background. I've been swimming this morning. I've done training. I was up early, and a, a friend of mine is um, uh, head of the local swimming pools where I live here, and they change every five minutes the lifeguards change there's one person sat up on the high chair and two wandering around and 30 years ago when he was a lifeguard they used to change every 30 minutes Mm -hmm. and i said why do you change every five minutes and he said well there's a number of reasons one is that people almost get hypnotized by the water but they can't focus their mind wanders after five minutes so we have to keep moving them to keep their attention span so I, I looked into this and I looked at the medical um, background to why we get distracted. And there's part of our basal ganglia system. There's a little little part of that called the subthalamic nucleus or STN for short. And it's like a flapper valve. And it's basically there to save our lives in a way. Um, and a good analogy is if you imagine that you're driving with your family in the car on a road trip, you're out in the country driving along, singing along to the favorite family song in the car, could be Queen or it could be whatever it is, you know, me growing up in the 70s. Dan McLean, American Pie. Yeah, it could be something like that. You're all singing along quite happily, okay? And as you come into a town, you're driving along, you're concentrating on the road, and suddenly there's this vehicle almost pulls out in front of you, come from a side road and slam this brakes on at the last minute because they haven't seen you. Now, what happens there is the subthalamic nucleus suddenly overtakes your mind and it cuts off what you were doing. So you stop singing. Um, your focus goes from driving in a straight line to taking evasive action, slamming your foot on the brake, and everybody sort of you know braces like this. Mm. And then you drive past the person, you probably make some sort of rude signal to them to tell them what you're thinking, and carry on driving. And the subthalamic nucleus disengages. Your heart rate starts to come down, and you go back to where you were, pick up the song, and everything's well. Now, if you carry on, and suddenly, you know, maybe half a mile up the road, somebody drive parks in the car, opens a car, the car door, or a cyclist pulls out, 
the subthalamic nucleus kicks in and again you take evasive action you stop doing what you were doing and you prepare you know sort of damage limitation to drive around them and, and take evasive action whatever that is now what happens here though is that because you've had two incidences that have caused you know very nearly caused you damage your subthalamic nucleus now stays open and it doesn't let you go back to focusing on what you were before so you've had two in a few minutes so what are you looking for now you're looking for the third one looking for the third thing that's going to come up and you never really go back to singing the song because you're, you're on edge you know you're nervous your heart rate so okay that's two where's the third one going to happen and you, you focus more on what might, what might be the distraction than what you're actually doing before now if you if you now put that into a business environment imagine you're working on a project on your laptop something like that and your phone's next to you so you're working away you're typing maybe writing a report or something like this working on a project and you've written one two three pages of scripts and everything and your phone buzzes the subthalamic nucleus kicks in stops you focusing on the project you pick the phone up and it might be a social media post that you commented on a couple of hours earlier somebody else has now commented and said something about you maybe on that Oh, so what do you do? You pick it up and you reply and you put your phone down. The subthalamic nucleus disengages. You read the last paragraph and you pick up from there and keep on working. But what happens 30 seconds later? Your phone buzzes again because somebody's now replied to the comment you made. So the subthalamic nucleus kicks in. You pick the phone up, you reply to that, you put it down and then you go back. Now this time you've got to read a little bit further back because you start to lose the flow and you carry on writing. And it may buzz again and you go across to it. And now you're focusing more on the distraction than you are on the project now you said something interesting earlier on it becomes a habit even though there's not a buzz on the phone you're now looking and you start to touch the screen of your phone because you're thinking oh that person didn't get back have i insulted them have i annoyed them have i have i <laughs> made them angry <laughs> why haven't they commented you know and they might be doing something else they might be i don't know whatever they're doing but you're now worried about it. you sit there almost looking for the next comment to come up well, that distraction has now taken over your world and you may spend five to 10 minutes engaging in that. What happens when you come back to your project? You've completely lost your train of thought and you've got to probably read the whole of the three pages you've written to get back to the flow. And in fact, you now may play and catch up. You start to make mistakes and you get into what we call distraction danger cycle where work takes longer. It's poorer quality. You have to do it again. You work longer into the evening. You disengage later in the day, which means you take your work to sleep with you. You don't really sleep well. You start the next day tired. You're more open to distractions. You start eating sugary energy drinks. And then you start mm. having what we call the desktop yawn about four o'clock, five o'clock, three o'clock in the afternoon, falling asleep at the desk. And these are all the things that happen. So subthalamic nucleus is there to actually protect us. But in many ways, because we continue to allow ourselves to be distracted, it takes over our life. And yeah. that's very dangerous. So that's 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 great. And it's just triggered a, a thought in my mind about making your phone work for you and making sure that it's serving us and not the opposite way around, you know, and um, so like what you mentioned, airplane mode can definitely be your friend. And like, I know that there's now these these this focus mode as well, where I get a notification of five to ten every evening to say, I'm, 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 blo I'm blocked out of everything. So if I want to open an app, I have to click on the app and then approve it that I can use it for the rest of that day my screen time has gone down hugely from from that and, and i think uh, people looking at not social media as good and bad but screen time as a whole is probably the best way of, of going about uh, your relationship with with social media but with email and with 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 screen times in general and that could include your your tv time as well yeah and if you think of the multiple channels that people use uh, i know companies who have email who have uh, internal chat they have text messaging and they have things like slack mm -hmm. and some people are, are trans transmitting information on all four platforms mm -hmm. so nice. you know and, and it, it, the, the classic scenario if you're working at your cubicle at your desk and an email pops up and it's from somebody who's working 30 yards away you sort of look at them and they're looking at you but you want to carry on with what you're working Next thing, there's a chat message pops up. You know, did you get the email I sent? And you carry on working. Then your phone buzzes, it's a text message. Did you see the chat message I sent you back, the email I sent you? And then you get a Slack notification, you know, and then they, they give up and they actually walk across. And say, <laughs> I did, but I'm kind of busy right now. And I saw what it was about and it's not Can't, you, can't you see the aluminous vest? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So that's a classic example. And when I say this, and a lot, I do a lot of talks about this and people are nodding their heads going, yeah, I know that person. I know that person. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and there's some interesting stuff. I mean, you may remember I talked about Tom Cochran, who was a Barack Obama's media specialist, social mm -hmm. media specialist when he was in the White House. And he went on to work for Atlantic Media Corp. 
And he did research into emails around the corporation. And he found out that people are receiving or giving around 288 emails on average per day, of which 72% were superfluous, had no value at all to the person who was receiving them. And he calculated that the cost in labor costs was 95 cents per email, which is equivalent to the company buying a Learjet. That's what it costs. Nobody's job description says manage email workflow. No, nobody's does. And yet we're all expected to do it. It's a huge drain yeah. on our efforts and everything. There's no email discipline out there. You know, like I said, the team huddles are great ways of cutting down an email. And mm -hmm. having criteria, I say this in the book, there's four different criteria of email where we talk about um, uh, critical, and, um, we talk about informational, we talk about routine, and we talk about operational. Those sorts of things are criteria. And you, you should really only be sending critical uh, over 45 minutes and only 15 minutes you send all the others mm -hmm. so when I talk about submarines you know nuclear submarines when they used to go under the water for months and months on end they could come near the surface and send a communications beacon up and over 30 seconds they'd transmit and receive all the information they needed for the next 24 hours and then go down below the water so that Russian satellites couldn't track them you can follow the same principle you don't have to be constantly sending email hold it back and send it in the window and people can then get that email and do something with it yeah and i think there what you find is you actually start yeah you, you start receiving less emails when you start to exercise a bit more discipline around what you're sending um i think that's great so i just want to um and again look thanks for for your time because it is so i, I know people listen will take so much from this i just have a couple of questions that i want to to wrap up with here paul and um, just in terms of like highly impressed as well how you you know how you have the music you have the exercise you have the family life you know and you have your work life and you work with these high profile clients how do you manage that all and i also want you to just maybe talk about that so the balance between all those different areas and then also just in terms of the discipline in terms of your exercise because uh you know the um these iron man events are they're no they're no mean feat they're, they're not something you take on just on a whim so uh how do you how do you motivate yourselves on, on those days where you're maybe not not feeling on top of your game as well so yeah maybe if you talk first to all four and how you get your balance yeah, so it, it's, you know, people say, how do you find time to do things? And I say, I don't find time. Uh, I, I, I schedule time. Mm -hmm. um, just coming to triathlon. So I train pretty much every morning, six days a week at least. I try and train in some shape or form. And there's two things that really I'm controlled by. Uh, I, I don't mind running in the rain in any weather. What I do, what I don't like doing, I've got a pretty expensive triathlon bike. I've got a road bike as well, but if I'm training for a big race, I'm going to be in my triathlon bike. I don't like taking that out in the wet. It's electronic shifting and the weather doesn't, rain doesn't do it any good. So I'm always looking at the weather forecast. And during the week, I'll look at the dry mornings where I can get out on my bike. The other thing is when I can get in the pool. Fortunately, I live very close to a, a 25 meter public pool that's open for lane swims at 5.30 to 7.30, five days of the week, unless it's public holidays. So I can schedule in my swim times and two hour swim from 5.30 to 7.30 in the morning, which means I get into bed early because I get up early to do things and then running you know i'll fit in doesn't matter what the weather is or time of day i like to train in the morning because I, I can't really train a lot after i've had something to eat i like to eat all day once i've done <laughs> exercise in the morning so i'm scheduling that in same with music you know if i'm if i'm practicing playing with an orchestra and i want to practice and i've got to block off the evening six till seven to practice whatever instrument i'm playing on or if i'm conducting i've got to block that time in so nothing else is going to take up that and, and it's, it's literally booking those times. And I say to people, you know, if you want to do more yoga, you've got to schedule that yoga. Pay for a month's worth of classes in advance. Schedule those classes three days a week. Mm -hmm. Now you're committed to it. Okay, so you've got to be finished work at 5.30 because your yoga class starts at 6. So book those in. Don't say, well, if I finish work at 5.30, I will go to yoga tonight. No, no, get tickets, buy tickets. And the funny old thing, you know, if, if you've bought a ticket to a major sporting event, you're not saying, well, I might go to that if I finish work. No, you're going to that. Mm. You're mm. having spent a lot of money on tickets. And let's face it, it's a pretty expensive commitment now going to a major sporting event. You paid a ticket for that. You're, you're getting there. You're making sure I like to get there really early and see the teams warm up and get some food and sit down and relax. And I don't like turning up last minute and rushing through the queues and everything. So that to me is a really important part is scheduling it and planning it and getting it done. Right. In those days, and we all feel like this. Now, I recently moved house and I did most of the move myself, so I've been tired. So this week's been tough to get out and train. I did take a couple of days off. I listened to my body and, you know, a guy who's 59 years old, she lifting and shifting heavy stuff. I was pretty tired at the end of 
three or four days of, of movement. So I decided I wasn't going to train for two days, mm -hmm. just completely kick back and let my body recover. That's very important. I probably overtrain at times. I need to kick back and listen to my body. So I did for two days. And then yesterday I started training again. And I, I simply feel about how will my day be if I've trained compare with how my day be if I haven't trained. Mm -hmm. And even though I'd consciously not trained on Monday and Tuesday, I felt bad during the day. You know, my energy was down and I felt a bit guilty because I hadn't trained. But I knew in my inside me that it was good for me not to train. Yesterday, I went out and did the first run in a few weeks. So I'm carrying a bit of a hamstring injury. So it felt good to get out and run. And when I got back and walked up the steps, walked in the front door, I felt good. I got out there and did something. Yeah. And this morning, you know, and my alarm went off at 4.45 and I was in the pool at 5.30, did an hour session in the pool. When I clear out the pool and get my energy and get my uh, protein shake and everything, I feel terrific because I did the full swim set, full hour intensive set this morning. And tomorrow, uh, I just had a, an appointment cancelled tomorrow morning, which is great because I can go out and do a long bike ride tomorrow morning. It's going to be great. <laughs> so Friday, I try not to work Fridays if I can. It's, uh, you know, if you manage your time well and really look, you know, you give yourself some freedom, which I, I like to do. I'm sort of winding down a bit of business commitments now. So tomorrow I can get out on the bike and everything. So I'm looking forward to that. But it's, it's, it's almost picturing walking in the front door you know if i've gone for a run and i'm walking the front door how do i feel terrific it means for a swim walk in the front door terrific cycle down the road um in my bike and i put it in the garage it feels like a really good day so this visualization of what the end game will be is mm -hmm. a big driver for me compared to how will i feel today if i just turn the light if i turn the alarm off and go back to sleep for an hour yeah so that visualization to me is critical keeping the end of mind and I, I like what you mentioned in the book about leaving your gear by the door to you know, to give yourself every opportunity to make it as easy as possible. So you're not looking for your Garmin watch or your Fitbit or whatever it is. You're not looking for your runners. You're making it as easy as possible the night before. And then you mentioned also that factor of, you know, if you don't get out, you're kind of stare, you're there looking at it for the rest of the day thinking, oh, I didn't deliver on that, you know. So you're, you're creating an expectation for yourself, like you mentioned. Yeah, if I'm putting all my running stuff in one room, I have to put it away because I didn't train. I call that the walk of shame. You know, I've got to put <laughs> it back in, in the closet. I just oh, I feel terrible about that. Sometimes I do wake up and I'm just like, no, today I just need to rest. I'm just yes. exhausted, Although, especially when I'm doing a peak week for Ironman, you know, four weeks out, I'm pushing myself to the limit. And then maybe a day towards the end of that day, six or seven, when I'm like, you know, I'm supposed to go and do a 20K run this morning. And my body's just saying, we need to rest. Mm -hmm. And that's fine. But that, that, you, know, you can't do that too often. You've got to make sure you get out there and do stuff. Amazing. And uh, just on that topic, like kind of last thing is uh, you mentioned the ABC method for looking at your day. And I must say, I love that. Can you, can you elaborate a bit on that for listeners? Yeah. So a lot of people I work with have to-do lists. I'm sure everybody who's listening to this has a, has a to-do list. And it's one of the worst things you can actually do because a to-do list is, you know, stuff you need to do. And what do we do on a Monday morning? We make a to-do list of 10, 15, 20 tasks. At the end of the day, we look, we've crossed off five or six of them. We start Tuesday and uh, we start with the same list as we had on Monday. So most of those tasks have now moved to Tuesday. We're adding a few, t few tasks to the bottom and then Wednesday we've still got some tasks from Monday to Tuesday to Wednesday and then Thursday and then Friday some of those tasks are still there we think we're probably never going to do these because they've just been moved from day to day to day as you go along so what I what I came up with and you know it's not my idea I saw other people use it and I've refined it to a certain extent is a-list tasks are things that must be done today okay you're not going to finish the day without them being done in fact if you've got to the end of the day and you haven't done them it doesn't matter they should never have been an a-list task Okay, so if you've got a client who you need to connect with today, it's absolutely critical. That is an A-list task. Mm. A B-list task are tasks that you need to do within the next two to three days. So it's like your, your, your flow. If you think of, if you're familiar with Kanban, it's the next up. It's the next thing that's going to come through. Okay, and then C-list tasks are all of the tasks that need to be done. And I would put a, a 10 or 14 day limit on that. It's mm -hmm. a backlog, if you like, moving forward. Now, looking at my, my schedule for the day, I'm going to take from my B-list task two or three A-list tasks. Because sometimes there won't be any A-list tasks because mm -hmm. there's nothing that has to be done today. Everything in my B-list task has to be done for the, over the next two or three days. I'm going to select one of those tasks and move it forward. So I'm not, you know, and it's, it, it's, it's importance of urgency, not importance of task, if you, if you know what I mean. So, and it's going to be broken down into small groups. So, if you've got a task, oh, well, you know, our strategic goal for this quarter is $500,000 in sales. We're not going to do that in a day. 
that is not an airless task. You might say, well, that's very important. Well, yes, it is very important. But maybe we need to draft a strategic plan in order to execute $500,000 of sales. So that could be something that's nail this time. I'm going to draft mm -hmm. the plan. It's going to take me mm -hmm. an hour to do it, and I'm doing it today at 2 o'clock. So I'm not going to go because I've got to present this plan to my senior leadership team tomorrow. So I must get it done today. Uh, and then the B list task, like I said, are things that two or three days flow coming through. So if, if you've gone two or three days and you haven't done some of these, they should never have been in that list. And the C is the big things, is the things that back up. Sometimes those Cs will sit there. And you may do a few little things that you'll just filter through. And it's what I call tap in the bucket. And a great description of this is, imagine you've got a bucket and you've got to transport three items, a large rock that just fits in the bucket, a bunch of small stones and half a bag of sand. So how would you put these in the bucket? Your task is to put them in the bucket, carry the bucket from A to B, but nothing must stick out at the top. Now, if you put the sand in first and then the small stones and the big stone, the big stone's going to stick out at the top. The best way to do it is to put the big stone in first, then you put the small stones in, shake them and tap it so they all sink to the bottom. Then you pour the sand in and you tap the bucket to get the sand to sink to the bottom. So tapping the bucket is you're working during the day and you may have 20 to 15 minutes at the end of the morning before you go to lunch. Tap the bucket, grab a couple of those C-list tasks that don't take long, throw them in, get them done out of the way. So you're filling up little gaps during the day and you'll get so much more done if you do things like that. Uh, and again, you know, in organizations who I introduced the ABC list to have said it's, it's transforming. Mm. And from a leadership perspective as well, you know, if you want to give somebody a task, you say to them, what's your A-list task like today? I've got these two things I must get done by the end of the day. Okay, fine. You crack on. I'm going to give it to somebody else. Look at the A-list task and they do two things. You say, well, actually, that's not really an A-list task. That can be done on Friday. Take that off. Put that back to your B take this on now, I need you to do this by the end of the day today. Mm -hmm. And it's great, it comes real, really back full circle to what we were talking about earlier on, knowing what your team are doing, how they're prioritizing it, and having a team ABC list. Yes. And you can extend that to the team, where the A list tasks are what you're going to do this week, your B list are what we need to do over the next two to three weeks, and then your C list can be what we need to do over the month. And then everybody then draws down those tasks and moves them forward. And, you know, Kanban in the Agile world, Kanban is a great descriptor of this. And this is just a, a simpler format of Kanban that individuals can work on. So it's a really good tool. It's described in the book in quite a bit of depth. Yeah, and, and I think, um, I remember you mentioning that all, all these efforts on personal productivity are ways of creating more time to do the things that you love with the people that you love. And I think when you remember the why of this, you know, a while actually benefiting the quality of your work as well, which is amazing. Because when people hear that, they think, right, you're doing things quicker, but well, the quality when you're working in a good focus zone is going to, is going to be up. So I just think at this point, Paul, I'd love to just ask you for if you have any kind of closing remarks on the topics that we've touched on today. And also, um, you know, if people are interested to find out more about your company, um, just to, to let them know where they can find that, please. Yeah, sure. I, I think the message really is that um, be re really structured in the way that you plan your day, not just your professional day, but also your personal time and your social time. And, you know, I'm not saying that you should have a, a spreadsheet for your weekend or your evenings and, you know, spend an hour with this child, an hour with that child, and then play golf, but have a pretty good idea of what you want to achieve because you get so much more out of life if you can do that. Mm -hmm. Understand the, the, you know, the, the zones, the energy zones. And if you spend quality time in each of your zones when you want to, then you'll get so much more out of it. You won't be diluted and your, your energy pack, your battery pack will be far more functional. And those are the key essences of what we're talking about here. And just control that STN. Don't allow things to, to take you away from other areas from there. Um, the best way to get hold of me is through the website, Paul Weston Consulting, P-A-U-L-W-E-S-T-O-N consulting.com. And there's a form you can fill in there to contact us or Paul at Paul Weston Consulting uh, is, uh, .com is my email address. Uh, feel free to reach out. There's a blog on there as well that covers off a load of stuff and there's a link to the book as well the book's available on amazon in kindle format as well as hard copy um so it's available there you know, we had a bit of a rush on the price and if you're aware but if you sell a lot of them in a short space of time amazon puts the price up a little bit so i was in arkansas a couple of weeks ago and we had a big rush on sales so it's starting to calm down a little bit now but uh, it's coming in at around 16 dollars, and i think it's 10 dollars for the Oh, well, well worth it. I'm, I'm only halfway through and I'm getting amazing value out of it. And I'm just thoroughly enjoying it as well. Uh, such practical examples and really liking just you, you, you've, you've, you've 
you know, you've been through all of those areas like the military, like achieving in those events and all these different fields. So, you know, it's somebody who's been at the coal face as well that you're learning from. And it's, it's fascinating to hear your examples from that. So, look, Paul, I just want to say thanks. And thanks so much for, you know, for giving up the time to have a, a chat with me today. And I can't wait to, to get the podcast out there because I know people are going to find it so valuable. Yeah, you're very welcome. Really enjoyed talking to Declan. It's been a pleasure and um, I look forward to uh, seeing this when it's uh, when it's available.